we're on a road trip. We're staying inside tier three restricted areas, but we're on a road trip and we are going here. So all I'm doing at the moment is just clearing the sanitizer out of the pipe work and the plate chiller. So we're going to close off, this is the whirlpool arm, close that off. And now the only way that the beer can flow is into the plate chiller and out via this pipe. So we'll let the beer into the plate chiller and then we'll let it out the plate chiller. Then we've got this valve here just before it hits the side glass of the, uh, the pipe work. You'll be able to see all the acid coming out of the plate chiller. Is that just pursed that you've got in there? Yeah, yeah, all pursed. And then it's just pushing the line. And that's it. And we'll put that on there. And in order to make sure that it's all nice and germ free, I'll push that through, uh, through the pipe for five minutes. So you're, you're recirculating boiling wort through the plate chiller and that's sanitising, I won't say sterilising, although it's close enough, yeah. sanitising the plate chiller. Yeah, well it's already a, a cleaning treatment when we finished the last brew yeah. with uh, caustic and it's been um, rinsed and then this morning before we started it's been sanitised with purses. Yeah. Uh, but obviously it's not a heat treatment, so this gives it a heat treatment which can get into all the places that a liquid can't. So mm -hmm. the other sides of the gaskets, for instance, yeah. they're going to get up to around 99, 98 degrees C. So yeah. it kill most of your nasties, but certainly not autoclave into a sterile environment. It's good enough for the yeast. And then uh, that alarm sounded, so we're ready to... I believe uh, add some protofoc tablets which are just good. Yeah. Yeah. And how many protoflot have you just chucked in there? Five. Five, so it's yeah. one, one per hundred litres. So I'm, I'm actually okay when I chuck a quarter into my 25. Yeah. I'm bang on the number yeah. with that. A lot of people put half a tablet in, don't they? But I think... Yeah, but this is Yorkshire. That's expensive. Yeah. That's <laughs> well, I came to the conclusion of five um, by just doing a trial uh, with uh, true at the end of the brew day. So um, Murphy's provide a detailed uh, method to do it. So you can dose each trial jar if you like or pint glass with a certain amount of it's, I think it's carrageen, I think is the correct term for it. It's like Irish moss. Yeah. But yeah, protoflock and then you can figure out which gives you the most compact protein bed at the end right. of it. So um, it doesn't always makes sense if you put more in you think oh, it'll do a better job but it, it actually makes what they call a fluffy uh, protein bed so it's still grabbing everything out of the liquid and probably make a clearer liquid on the top but you don't get as dense yeah. a protein bed at the bottom so it's more susceptible to disturbance or being, being sucked up the tape on the yeah that's something that i've noticed by not having a filter inside the inside the kettle anymore um that it forms like a clay layer on the bottom rather than a big fluffy bunch of trube. That's for the same with all Chris Millington really, true. Because these are called cattle finings. And then you have process finings which will go into your tanks yeah. uh, or auxiliary finings. And then you have finings that go into your packaging. So, so we've eliminated all animal products from the brewing process. 
we now use Celebri for any cakes or casks of which which are a little bit stubborn and they won't clean up properly. So this is Celebri here. Yeah. That's basically um, the same as uh, auxiliary finings, um, but I think it's got an extra additive in there, which must be a secret, special secret ingredient. But it's uh, it's animal product free. But I think the silica based or something like that. Um, but yeah, what's so would it be fair to say that that your your production is is kind of vegan friendly then? Yeah, I would, yeah. Right. yeah. I can't think anywhere where we see an animal product uh, even coming close to touching the beer, apart from me having some milk in the fridge for coffee. Corned beef sandwich. Yeah, corned beef sandwich. <laughs> but certainly this side, yeah. Um, Would that be worth investigating getting accreditation from the Vegan Society well, as another yeah. tick on your... As another tick on the box of. Does it work? I mean, if there's no animal products in, in the process, I mean, it's it's like if you have a vegan meal in uh, in a restaurant, they don't get the vegan society to come out and check the restaurant. No, but they don't. I'm just wondering about whether it would be a a, a reasonable marketing tool. If, if it's free, I can't do it. If it's free, right? Vegan society. <laughs> Here you go. I'll Google that when I get back. We'll find out. It's probably about ten grand a year. Yeah, that's what I <laughs> That would be something that would be interesting to follow up to find out. Yeah. But this stuff from not in bulk wasn't organic. Or it certainly didn't say organic on the label. Right. But the stuff at uh, wholesale foods online, they are organic, it's cheaper than their uh, and they're non organic, if you like. I often question the criteria by which things are really classed as organic, or whether or not it's the pesticides that might be used in the production. But in the UK, if you're growing organic veg in one field and not in another field, is it really still organic? I don't, I don't understand how you can separate one field that might be blasted with insecticides and pesticides and growth hormones from the field next door that isn't. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see where that comes with kind of like coconut. Yeah, and of course you've got all the coconuts imported obviously, so are, are this, is the requisite for an organic status in the country of origin for coconut. The or here, has, yes. The one for the UK. If not, yeah. then it's a meaningless label, effectively. But it doesn't matter anyway, because it's all vegan, so it's okay to oh, buy, yeah. folks. <laughs> Unless it's going to tell some of this coconut as well. Now, I'm thinking of the banana fritter things that you get in your alpha and what have you. Oh, you get little bits of banana. Yeah. Fritter. I thought they were really healthy, dried pieces of banana. It turns out they're deep fried. Yes. In yeah. palm oil. And it converts the sugars into something which is a bad sugar rather than a healthy sugar. And yeah. yeah. Let's not go there. No. <laughs> um, right, I need to just pick the recipe up. See where I am. Yeah. And this is the recipe. You've actually published this on, online, haven't you? Yeah, this is available on the website. Yeah. Um, it's not the same recipe that uh, Tom and I developed a long time ago. We've changed a few things about a little bit. So Tom's got his own version of the coconut shy PA. Right. And this is a very similar, but just slightly shifted version of it. Have you put that on Beersmith? Uh, I think it's on Beersmith. Right, yeah, okay. I've got quite a few recipes floating around on Beersmith. But I mainly use Beersmith at the minute so I can sync my computer at work with my computer at home. So things that I put on the clouds yeah, are used are accessible. So right, okay. I don't know though, sometimes some of them sneak right. through. And you mentioned Tom, for those who don't follow um, either Chris's channel, which is Harry Brew 69 the channel you're talking about is new to homebrew Tom. Yeah, so he's, uh, he's just in the process of... Uh, building, he's, he's building a new brewery. Yes. He's building a new brewery again and he's starting to document it more often as well. 
and so he must have more time um, with his hobbies and uh, he's got most of his move finished now. It looks like, I mean, it's quite a colossal undertaking that he's, he's, he's done there. He's put completely new drainage in and yeah. uh, a complete yeah. inside skim to, to the garage, a complete room inside a room, if you like, and uh, all really the wiring. So. Pastoring and joinery and plumbing. His beard. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about what's edited out of this later, shall we? We'll be all right. <laughs> but it was Tom who was responsible for you going for the um, SS Brutech kit, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was. It was I was really tempted to um, make some stuff out of some old cakes, but because I wanted to do it before COVID as a bit of a display uh, so we could get people in and have a brew day with some of the regulars from the pub, it would have made sense for us to have a nice looking piece of kit rather than a, uh, what I would be more comfortable with thrown together Eve Robinson style it. But, um, you mean like what I've got? Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I like them, but to be fair, they're more durable as well, you know, um, and more moddable because you don't worry too much about cutting an old in, yeah. you know, in, in an old keg. Whereas these things are paying three, four, five hundred pounds for a, a tub yeah. or a, a, you know, a vessel. What size know. thickness is the, uh, the stainless steel? Because I mean, kegs are sort of like almost bulletproof. Yeah, so I think a keg might be around the region of one, 1.6 mil. Um, I think this stuff's only about 0.8, might even be less. Right. Might even be less because I think actually some of these tanks that are made were 0.8. I'll have, to talk, I'll have to refer back to the videos that I made when I built them. But, um, yeah, it, it doesn't need to be that that thick, realistically. Kegs, obviously, are designed to take pressure of up to 100 PSI in yeah. a commercial setting with some idiot throwing them off the back of a lorry, you know? Yeah. So they need to be quite durable. But nobody's chucking this stuff around. It's a shame they just don't do 100 litre case. They do. Do they? Yeah, but they're few and far between. That's about to, to, to ruin my day now because I've been planning everything around. When they come back into stock with the malt miller or, or whoever else of, of getting at least a 20 litre mash ton, but I'm, I'm thinking 20, uh, 20 yeah, litre, 20 yeah. gallon, 20 American gallons. Right, we're going to have to get some more of so five kilos yeah. of mashed up in the food processor yeah. coconut. I don't know if this is going to go well at all. I'm going to back off just for a second. I've turned the heat off. Yeah, so we've just got that uh, tap firing at us at a rate of knots. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the whirlpool arm on. As well as that actually, I need that one over And I'm going to start uh, cooling down to 80. So we're going to start the chill. With a slow whirlpool. And that should just take the edge off. So you're adding the coconut exactly as you would add flame a flame out, out hops. Yeah. And then you're doing a, a, a coconut stand for yeah. half an hour. Yeah, so the coconut's going to sit in here um, until we get to 80. And then when we get to 80, I'm going to add some Columbus and some mosaic hops. And then I'll leave it for half an hour with all of it just steeping. Got a small target in here, rather than we can come up, Martin. Future enhancements will be to have smell attached yeah, to <laughs> to YouTube videos. We can do scratch and sniff. 
It's probably not an idea you should suggest to Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> You see the oil's coming out the side. I don't know if you're going to get past the steam or not with the uh, camera. There we go, look at yep, all that. Yeah, gotcha. So they're all being liberated with the hot work. Oh, crikey, that smell is... is... Oh, the lush. Green, isn't it? Yeah. Oh. Now this is a relatively simple process, getting the coconut into the uh, boil kettle because it's hot and uh, we're not worried about our oxidation. You have to do exactly the same thing in the fermenter when it comes to the dry offing stage. Okay. And of course you're panicking a little bit about introducing any oxygen in yeah. with the coconut. So what I did was flush the headspace of the fermenter and then approached it in exactly the same way, but in stages. So I just put enough coconut in there to create a little mound then leave it for five minutes. And then, and then do another look. And then obviously hoping yeah. that the CO2 had percolated through and pushed yeah. the oxygen out. And then I'd come and poke it under the liquid and add another lot, yeah, and just keep doing that. And then I had to come back to it as well, the second and the third day, because it had kind of bobbed up like a big cork. You know, it had made one solid mass of coconut. So I had to try and keep it submerged. So what happens, do you just purge it again and then bash it down with a spoon or something? Yeah, so if you look on the top of the tank, we've got aspirators on all of them now, so there's always CO2 being fed into the tank. So uh, it gets a 10 second blast of CO2 every, uh, I think, 8 or 12 hours. So that just keeps all the tanks topped off. Yeah. And that's run with a little control system that we've got, like just a little a timer. So <clears throat> as you cold crash, obviously it's then pulling it would be pulling, trying to pull oxygen in. Yeah. So all you're doing really is giving it some CO2 so it doesn't need to be pulling anything in. That's right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, when we're taking the beer off as well, if we're not going to empty a tank completely, as with the pail over there, we canned 500 tins of pail uh, yesterday, but there's still 200 litres of beer in that tank. Okay. So we've uh, got the aspirator on there, and that's just purging, just to make sure we don't get any O2 ingress, which, is, which will ultimately ruin the beer. And are you going to be canning that now? No, so the reason why we didn't put it all into can is because Stuart needs some for the pub, but the cask washer kicked the bucket on, on the same day. Right, so it okay. Like we could either put it all in can, or just top the tank off with CO2, Put it into suspended animation until um, I fix the cast washer right, and okay. get back on, you know, get the show back on the road. Yeah. Right, so that is just about that. And then I have one more little trick up my sleeve just to help. So I took Now a lot of people do that with their hops, they recirculate through the basket yeah. in order to push it out through the edge of the basket into the main bulk of the kettle. Yeah. I've seen it done quite a bit, it's exactly the same thing, because we want it to obviously not just be it there in a kind of compact solid yeah. mass. Try that. We'll just keep adjusting it until we get a nice speed. It's really fast, actually. There we go. Get a start. Yeah, I might put an elbow on on here. Just see if you want to point straight into the kettle, you know. Yeah.
So you're going to run that now until it's down to 80 degrees? Yeah, so as well, I'm going to keep running it, I'll just turn the, cool, the cooling water off. So that will continue to go round and round for half an hour. Right. But it won't go much past 80, 80 degrees. We'll keep it at 80. We're at 85.9 already. So it's been about, what, um, 15 minutes? 20 minutes? Yeah, I don't think it's even. I turned it off when you went blocking, so it's been off a bit longer. Oh, okay. But it says... Charlotte's um, joined us. I think it says 59, 60 degrees on the side, but it's, it's not that cool. We've got some stratification in here, because I've been sending it all into the top. You can see it's still quite steamy coming out of the top here. So that's mosaic and oh, I can smell. It. Oh, oh, that's lovely. Yeah. So that's the. Uh, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna hover here for a moment. Columbus. Oh. Columbus is a highly underrated mm. hop. You can hear it when it's a pump. too far because it's actually squirting everywhere look. So I can get that stuffed into the coconut. Get it uh, liberated somewhat from the sides. Oh that's looking good. That's smelling amazing. <laughs> I might give this a little bit extra in here you know today. It's not going to do it any harm is it? Just extract a bit more flavour because when I took the coconut out last time it still smelled like it had a lot to give up. Might give it an hour. Have you experimented with, with different levels of smashing it to bits in the food processor? Because you could literally take it down to very, very fine particles. Yeah, that's good, yeah. It's something to consider, isn't it? It depends how long. Because the smaller the pieces, the greater the surface area, the more the extraction. Mm. So. I suppose the reason. Um, well, I've got it in the basket, is so it doesn't get caught in the pump and block the pump filter. If yes. you took it down to like a, a flower, yeah. then it could just run well, through the system and it wouldn't really... And you, do I, do I want it running through the plate chiller? Do you know what I mean? Well, it'd still break down when you clean it out with caustic. Yeah, it would. I suppose there's still the oils and any other fine particles are going through there regardless, aren't they? So yeah. Because that's why I, I gave up with the filtering and just let stuff go through the, the plate chiller and it might slow it down a little bit, but I, I can still kill anything that's in there and flush it all out with a caustic. Yeah. But I've only got one of those tiny little malt miller jobbies anyway, so you know, you've got more surface area, you, you're, you're going to get less clogging in your plate chiller than yeah. I get in mine. I have to take mine apart as well. Yes, you can. Which I don't like doing. Right. Just leave it. Do its thing. Whoa. I'm gonna make some noise now. I'm afraid. I'm gonna have to clean that tank. Yeah. So that's reading 68. Uh, what's this? 68. Probably just give it. Give it an hour. Right. Well, I am gonna love you and leave you, dear sir. Thank you for a wonderful afternoon. That's no problem, I'll edit out all those horrible things that you said about Tom. I'll leave them in. And I'll put a link to your channel underneath for the people who follow my rubbish. Um, if you like this rubbish, please consider subscribing to me and to Chris's channel, Harry Brew 69 Again, down there, I'll put the thing. New to Homebrew Tom. And uh, I'll put a, a, a link up to the Brew Shed uh, website where you can go and buy 
some of these wonderful brews. And you heard it here first, the, um, the special advent calendar beer packs, which I think are going to be a, a rocking success. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a smashing way to go. And, um, and, and, and we've got it on film that I was the first person to buy one. So, wicked. Right, uh, Mr. Harrison Hawks, sir, thank you ever so much. Wonderful afternoon. Chris is always ever the optimist, and whatever happens in the next couple of months, there are so many people behind you and so many people rooting for you, but we know you're not, you're not going to go under, and we know it's going to be stressful for you, so we're with you and, and we're behind you all the way, mate. So good to you. you. And, uh, and keep, keep posting the videos. I will try my very best. Right, so this is me and Mr. Harrison Hawks, Harry Brew 69. And Charlotte, let's come to say hello, in Harrison's Brewery. Cheers, Chris. Cheers.